Hi and welcome to Mark's Motivational Podcast from another Authors Tuesday. So it's great to welcome another great guest on the podcast today who's have our new book out now, or her first book, is it? Um, yeah. Out, out on the 4th of March. So um, Ruth O'Leary, you're very welcome to the show. Thanks a lot for coming on. Thank you, Mark. Delighted to be here. This is my first uh, podcast, so it's very exciting. Great stuff. And like, so that, that's a great way, place to start if you want to tell the listeners a little bit about yourself and the, yeah. the book you have out would be would be perfect to start. Yeah, Grant, <laughs> well, yeah. Like, I live here uh, near Dolly Mount with my husband, my three sons and our golden retriever dog. Yeah. That's where I'm from. Uh, parents are from Dublin, grandparents are from Dublin, and grand- great-grandparents are from Dublin. So that's kind of unusual. Um, I Like I said, I work as a movie extra and that's freelance. So it could be four days a month or it could be 12 days a month. You never know. Um, I work for two different companies and I work as a chaperone as well on movie sets. So the days where they have kids under 18 out, um, I could go out and chaperone them and make sure they work for only the amount of hours they're allowed to work and they get all their breaks, that kind of thing. Yeah. So um, that part of my life. So I have been in productions like Vikings in Wicklow wow. um, Kin filmed all over Dublin um red rock if you remember that uh garda program and um bad sisters just recently mm-hmm. and fair city so nearly every second week i could be sitting in mccoy's or walking into the community center <laughs> yeah. pretend pretend and i'm going to something or pre- picking up pretend bread in the spa shop while the actors are behind us yeah. um so some productions are very kind of, let's say, normal like that because you're just going in with your normal clothes and doing normal things. And then other productions like Vikings are brilliant or uh, last year before I did uh, The Pope's Exorcist with Russell Crowe. So we were all dressed as nuns and priests and everything. And they're great productions because you really feel like you're part of it when you have to go to costume, hair, makeup, the whole lot. Um, and I think it helps working in a creative environment, you know, because I'm watching people put scripts into action, basically. Yeah. Um, and you're surrounded by, you know, film crew and everybody working together to get whatever came out of the writer's head onto the paper I- into a movie or a TV series. Um, and then as a writer, I'm a very visual writer, so I get scenes in my head that I have to put down on paper that will hopefully resonate with people when they read it mm-hmm. um but yeah the freelance uh, part of the job definitely gives me time to write and then I usually bring that doesn't work all the time but I bring a notebook and pen with me um if I'm working because there's an awful lot of hanging around with those jobs generally yeah. um so sometimes I've gone in and written a whole chapter if I can get a quiet corner it depends how many people are in um and because I have to sit there and I can't really do anything else until we're called, um, sometimes it gives me an opportunity to do that. So that's, I think it works well with it, you know? Yeah, well, that's that's very exciting work. <laughs> that's, that's brilliant. Yeah. Uh, yeah, great stuff. And your book, congratulations on your on your, on your your novel. Um, yes. Coming out on the 4th of March. Um, I know. What, you, yeah, that's yeah great. let uh, me just yeah. tell you about it. So, Anyway, I love the cover, for starters. I think it's very different, and uh, I love the colours in it. And um, so, will I tell you how I came up with the idea for this? Yeah, that'd be brilliant, yeah. Right yeah. Place well, start, actually, yeah. I, may as well, I may as well start at the beginning, how, how I got into writing at all. So, um, it was never something that I wanted to do or dreamed about doing. Um, you know, when I was a kid, you know, they always ask, you know, it, whatever you wanted to be when you were a kid sometimes is kind of maybe what you were supposed to be. So I wanted to be either an air hostess or an actress. So I went into the travel business when I left school and did loads of traveling. And now I'm an extra. So I guess I did those things, but writer never, ever came into it. Now I would say that English was my favorite subject in school and I loved writing essays. So that was always there. But in but then life goes on, you know, you get busy. And um, so in 2013, I was um, doing a yoga class in a place called Crosscare. So Crosscare, 
I'm not sure if they operate outside of Dublin, but in Dublin, they run different organizations. And one of them's a carers group and I'm a carer. So I was doing a yoga class and one of the girls in that class said, oh, I'm going into this writer's class. And I said, oh, I couldn't do that. And she said, oh, no, come on. It's, it's you know, it's good crack. It's really easy going. And uh, so I just went along and uh, the exercises were just great. And as soon as I start writing them, we'd have a so we do exercises during the class and then we'd have homework to write a short story about that exercise. And I just felt that it was just a great escape. And as soon as I started writing, it just kind of flew out. So I kept going to that class and um, I sent in, in that year, I sent a short story into Ireland's own. Now, I want to give a shout out to Ireland's own. They, if there's any short story writers listening to this, um or poets every year they have competitions for short story memoir poetry but at any time you can send them in a short story and they particularly like themed ones so let's say i had um last month just gone um they published a short story of mine in their valentine special and they do it months and months in advance. So right now, if you wanted to get a story in Ireland's own, it would be, let's say, a summer story. And then in the summer or in September, start sending them, like in the summer, send them a Halloween one. In the September, send them a Christmas one. Um, but they are very generous to new writers. So they published my short story, my first short story ever, and I couldn't believe it. Like, And that all obviously gave me the confidence to think, mm -hmm. well, somebody who runs a magazine you know thought it was good enough to put in it so then i sent another short story to woman's way and they published it so i thought this is great and i start writing more and between the two um i just they both of them published a good few of my stories over the years um and then things just got busy and i did different writing courses mainly night courses um like nothing too serious but like the uh, big smoke writing company used to have six week courses and that type of thing but in 2020 just after new year I decided right now I have the time and space I'm going to seriously learn more and get more serious about my writing and I just googled writing courses and I came across writing.ie and they have a online Facebook group called Writers Inc and I joined in the February and literally as soon as I joined there is nearly something to do every single day in that group and not only do they I consider it like an apprenticeship you know if you were going to be a carpenter or a plumber you'd have to do your apprenticeship and I, I feel like it's a writing I felt like it's a writing still do writing apprenticeship because they teach you about different styles of writing and there's a critique thing every Thursday you can put in 500 words of something that you're working on and they and it's all really kind you know like if you don't like or don't understand somebody's kind of writing you just move on and then you'll you'll you know give tips on the genre that you understand so like I would never advise anybody in our group or even comment on their fantasy writing or historical fiction because they're two genres that I don't read um, but anyway, it's really helpful. And um, it also teaches you about the publishing business because writing a book and publishing a book are two completely different things. Yeah. yeah. Finding an agent and finding a publisher. And they also do loads of interviews with agents, um, self-publishers and different publishers and authors at different stages of their career. So I really felt like this was, like I said, an apprentice. So I joined them in February 2020 and sure what happened in March 2020. Suddenly we all had, we were closing down for two weeks and I was like, yay, I'm going to have loads of time to write now for two weeks. And um, so that was 20, yeah, so that was, so I was still writing short stories at that stage. And I really thought that the people who wrote books in my group were like a different group of people. Like, that's what they did. I never thought that I could do that. And, but there was a group in the Writers Inc. group who were going on to do NaNoWriMo in November. Now, in case anybody doesn't know what NaNoWriMo is, it's National Novel Writing Month. And it was invented by a college in San Francisco. And the whole idea is that you write 50,000 words in 30 days. So it's kind of crazy. 
So you have to kind of plan it out in October and then just go for it on the 1st of November. So I decided I was going to do that and give it a go. And near the end of it, like five days before the end of November, I had reached the 50,000 and I couldn't believe it. And I then I just thought, wow, well, if I can write 50,000 words in 30 days, surely I can write 80 to 90,000 over six months or a year. Mm. And it was then, and then of course the next question is, yeah, but what would I write? So because it was November, 2020, we were in lockdown and myself and I'm myself and my girlfriends, let's say there's eight of us. We would normally try and go on one weekend break a year. And normally because I've, of my background with travel business, whether it was Ireland or whether it was away, I'd come up with the ideas. I don't mind doing the research. I love doing the research. So I would normally be coming up with ideas. So then, of course, I said, well, we can't go anywhere, but I can write about a weekend break. Mm. And and literally, I said, I'll call it the weekend break. Like, I, And then I Googled to see had anybody else got a book called the weekend break on Amazon and they didn't. So that was great. So I had the name and then I thought, well, it's a bit of a hassle. Like what it's boring to write about getting taxis, going to the airport, finding your hotel. <laughs> So I said, right, it's going to be a train. They're going to, so it's going to be Ireland. So the very first page of the book opens in Houston Station in Dublin. And there's four women. There was initially six, but there was this four women and they get on a train to Galway. And the whole idea is the four women each thinks that everybody else's life is perfect. Um, and of course it's not. So it's four women, four secrets. And the secrets, it all kicks off in Galway, basically. So um, the people that you thought had the perfect life don't don't have the perfect life. Nobody does. Um, but the incidents happen to bring out different people's secrets at different times. Um, and then it really it's their reactions to it that the book is about. And will their friendship and loyalty like will it survive these reveals? Um, so. That's, and so like I said, just because it was my first book, I hadn't a clue. So I had six women. So when I put in the first bit into Writers Inc. with six women, that you know, the head of the writers group is um a writer called Sam Blake. She writes crime. And she immediately came back and said, That's too many people. It's gonna confuse the readers. You're gonna have to have six points of views. She said, cut it down to four. So and that's the great thing about being in a writer's group. Like, imagine finding that out when you'd finished the book, right? Yeah, <laughs> after <sorry>. after 90,000 <laughs> words, um, you know, you'd like just lie down on the floor and cry. So yeah. this, <laughs> so I, I had just come up with this idea, put this idea in the book. This is what I'm starting to write. And immediately then that was the first piece of advice. So I went back and uh, changed it to four. Um. And that's, yeah, that's a really good advantage of being in a group that you can get that kind of information. Like she, I think she's just published her 10th book. Um, and it's actually in, it's actually in the top 10 Irish Times paperbacks at the moment. It's uh, Three Little Birds it's over there. Um, so she's, and she's also head of the Society of Authors in the UK. Her agent is Simon Truen, who is also the agent of uh, Paul Murphy, who just won the Booker Prize. So she knows the business inside out. Mm. So it's um, lucky for me, she's the head of my writing group. So that's how the whole idea for the book came about. Right. No, that's a great story. Like, um, would you mind uh, again showing the pictures of the book yeah. for people watching on YouTube? Because I, I love the, the cover. It's great. Um, who done the, designed the cover for you? Well, that's pool bag. So pool bag, oh, I yeah. had, yeah. yeah. So um, this is the I, you know, I had I had thought right because I'm fifty seven, and I thought right, I'm I'm going to write this thing, and um, I'm I'm going to get a pub, I'm going to publish it. So I also joined up a whole load of self publishing groups, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, because I wasn't going to wait, you know, till I was drawn the pension at sixty five or seventy. Well, God, probably seventy by the time I get there, um. You know, the amount of people who have stories on their laptops that don't get published. So I started to educate myself about self-publishing as well and following self-publishing. So, and you know what? That takes the huge pressure off. 
finding an agent, finding a publisher, being disappointed, because in my head, I was going to publish this book either way, right? Yeah. Um, but I said, I'll give it a go at the traditional publishing as well. Um, and part of the, you know, the pros of having a publisher is that they have cover designers. Mm -hmm. So you're not copying images from Canva. You're not paying people a lot of money or anything. Well, you don't pay anything to a traditional publisher. So, uh, so Pullbeg came up with this cover. Right. Um, and then uh, I really like the cover. My laptop is this cover, my laptop bag. It's one of my, this kind of light purple is one of my favorite colors. So they're actually, it's a three book deal. So they're going to keep this color scheme for my next two books as well. So I'm delighted about that. Right. Um, and it's a bit different to what's out there because there's an awful lot of crime on the shelves at the moment. Yeah. And you know, the crime books, there's so many of them that have like either a female walking away into a dark lane or, uh, <laughs> yeah. you know, something sinister, you know, just yeah. a lonely man walking down or walking towards you with no face in a lane. So um, when I showed this to Eason's because I got uh, bookmarks done up. Now, I did them myself. Very nice. Um, very nice. As, yeah. In, yeah. as in ordered them from Vistaprint. But Poolbeg did the measurements for me, but I paid for these. And um, if there's any debut authors listening to this, these are better than business cards. Because you have, um, I have a few of them now, but um, at the back of them, let me just find them. Um, on the front, you have your cover of your book and your name. And then on the back, you can put all your social media and your, your email. Your email. And I, so when I went into Eason's a couple of weeks ago to, org to talk about my launch, I handed them this and they were like, oh, we've nothing on the shelves in those colors at the moment. And, I, and I've handed them out. I was at an arts council thing uh, two weeks ago and we were standing in the queue. People were saying, what are you writing? And you can hand them out. So um, it's like 250, 280 bookmarkers for 25 euro on Vistaprint. That's, brilliant. that's really good. That's, yeah. that's one of my top tips. Yeah, great stuff. Yeah, oh, that's great. And um, you're saying it's going to be, you're, well, are you doing the launch for it? Um, the launch is on International Women's Day on the 8th of March, 8th of and March, it's yeah. in um, Eason's in uh, Stevens Grain Centre. So I'm really right. excited about that. Great stuff. No, congratulations. Yeah. yeah. And yeah, look, that's brilliant. Um, do you want to read maybe the blurb for people to give them a give them a taste for as well, Ruth, please? Sure. Yeah. So on the front of us, um, we have four friends, four secrets, one explosive weekend. And Carmel Harrington, do you know Carmel Harrington? She's a Wexford writer. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. yeah best selling writer. Uh, the Moon Over Kilmore Key, The Girl from Donegal, books like that. So I sent it to her and she gave me a great quote for the front of it, which is an accomplished debut will keep readers enthralled until the end. So I was delighted with that great. Um, because that catches people's eye. Mm -hmm. And she mentioned the book then on her Insta page. I'm sure this is that. Listen, the the... There's so many books get published all the time and any little edge you can have to, you know, it's great to have a book, but people have to know about it. Mm -hmm. uh, they have to know that it's in the world. Right. So um, I find just connecting with people, uh, other writers on Twitter and Instagram, just liking their posts, things like that. Uh, made it e easier for me then to look at she's in my genre. So look at somebody in your genre Imagine where your book, if you had a book on a shelf in Easton's or Dubray or a book station, uh, who would it be beside? Follow them. And then when it comes to looking for a quote or something like that, you know, it's it makes sense to get it from. So there's no point in me getting a quote from a, a YA writer. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. This isn't YA. So I think it's important to always know your genre mm. so that you know your audience. So I'd hope that people who like Carmel Harrington then might pick up my book. You know what I mean? Great idea, yeah. Great idea. Yeah. yeah. So let me tell you about the four women anyway. Um, I'll just read the back of the book here. Yeah, please. Um, Vivian's perfect life is a facade and she wants out. She needs a divorce fast. That's Vivian. Helen's nightly glass of wine has become a bottle or two and her drinking is threatening her marriage. Clara feels she must lie to her husband to save her sanity and reach towards some freedom. 
And Miriam, Miriam wants to change her life and she does so in the most dramatic way possible. Her friends are supportive when she tells them, but she knows there's still a hidden truth that can never be exposed. Their time in Galway has life-changing consequences. As the weekend unfolds and their secrets are laid bare, will it be too much for some to cope with? Will their friendship and loyalty to each other survive the weekend break or is it and its painful aftermath? So, four women, four problems, and it all kicks off in Galway. Um, but it, the women are in their 40s and um, it, it covers issues like, well, marriage breakdown. That's not it. There's no spoilers there. Um, it, somebody with a drinking problem, which is due to her menopause symptoms, which 100% 100 of women go through. Um, and Miriam is caring for her mother who has dementia. And because she's not married and because she doesn't have a partner and she doesn't have a child, she is taking on the burden. Uh, the siblings are like too busy and it's like, well, you don't have kids and, you you know, so sh you'll take on the burden of that. And then um, so there's the whole thing when you get to that kind of 40, between 40 and 50, and you think that your life is settled that actually these things crop up. Um, so, and Clara has a, a child with additional needs that kind of threw all her plans and her future and herself and her husband have different uh, views on how they're dealing with that. So they are what I'd consider um, relatable. They'll be, they'll be relatable to yeah. somebody. Yeah. Um, She's thinking that, yeah, very related to a lot of people that are reading it, yeah. Yeah, yeah I mean, like, like I said, I'm in my 50s, so a lot of, my friends, like my own parents, uh, are in great uh, health, um. But we celebrated their joint 80th birthday party last month, so we're very lucky, uh, because they were dancing at their own party, right? Uh, so uh, we're very lucky. But I know, you know, friends of ours who are parents in their 80s and 90s, um, this is something that you just don't think about until it lands on your doorstep. Yeah. So, um, I don't uh go into I so. All of these issues come up, right? And uh, but there's things that happen in Galway that make them, you know, jump out. Um, and I think it's kind of a universal thing, a weekend break. Like even if it was men going away, right? You're gonna show up at Houston Station with your best gear on, you're gonna be dying for the weekend, you're not gonna sit in the train and go, oh, you're not gonna believe what happened to me. That just doesn't happen because you you wanna forget about your problems, right? And no one will want to sit beside you if you started the weekend off like that. But it's, and if you went out on a night out, everyone would be pretending everything's great and everyone would have a great night and they'd go home and you wouldn't know. And in fact, sometimes on night out, you might say, you know, Jesus, Pat, I didn't get to talk to you at all. Do you know what I mean? At the mm -hmm. end of the night? Yeah. But a weekend away creates that space that may, like the first 12 hours are always brilliant. First night's always great. But maybe the next day you might be going for a walk or you might have a coffee with someone and they might say, do you know my dad hasn't been that well? Or mm. uh, my wife's been laid off. Do you know what I mean? So I don't, even though this is about women, the whole idea that when you go out for a night out, you don't really hear people's problems and you're not going to tell, you're not going to unburden yourself to people in a night. But over a weekend, you have the space for things to crop up. Yeah, that's great because what I get out of it as well, basically what you're saying there, what I, what I get out of it is that every, like everybody thinks everybody's life is perfect. And then yeah. like, it's, it's a good message to think like, you know, because looking at Facebook and all, all you know. All, oh, all yeah. This, it's fabulous instagram lives yeah exactly yeah so that that's a good message you, you you're given there as well mm. yeah brilliant and you, you, the cover itself did you kind of give an idea of what you wanted to pull back was it well no they came back with one first and i said it's too young it was yeah. uh, there was um sunglasses there was there was things that were too it looked more like a hen's weekend okay so yeah. i went back with drawings to kind of give an idea of what I thought. Right. Um, but then they came back with this. So I think it was just, we had to kind of, so they came up with one and there's a, it, um, I mean, it wasn't awful, but to me, immediately to me, it was, and like, I think as well, that's an advantage of being an older writer. If I was in my twenties, I probably would have gone, oh yeah, that's fabulous. That's great. 
yeah. but it just didn't it just wasn't right and and it was a perfect cover nothing to do with the cover designer it was a perfect cover for a younger book but i knew and i guess i knew i know the women in this group in this book so i knew what they'd been through and it was just a bit too light and flowery let's say the cover so when i typed all that back in in an email to say this is why you know i think we just need to change it around a bit and make it then they came back with that and then i was delighted with it great stuff yeah because it's 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 kind of it's keeping your the way you want it like you know it's it's given because you know i i've self-published myself uh, yeah so, but people listening may not know that so thanks a lot for sharing that so it's, you've got the option to change it if, if you want so, yeah. yeah now i guess it depends too on maybe the, the genre because i know like um let's say i was writing crime i know they go through like there's there's method in their way of choosing colors and everything because they go through what's the what's the top ones on amazon let's say actually if you're self-publishing you could probably do this as well so there sometimes people are attracted to the same type of covers uh, it's more obvious in crime that it like like we're talking about you know the man going down a dark alleyway or whatever yeah. and instantly you know that's going to be a crime or a thriller so that i i understand their need to make the because people are making decisions so fast you know on amazon or when they walk into a shop people don't have as much time to browse so i guess the publishers and people who are self-publishing, you need to to let the reader know immediately what kind of book this is, what genre it is. Um, so um, yeah, so it was more of an age thing with me. The cover was initially too young, and then I think that fits perfectly now. Oh, that's great! Thanks a lot for sharing. It's great. And can I ask you as well, Ruth? Um, do you have a kind of a system or a strategy you use when you write? Well. Um, yeah, so I get an idea. So I get an idea in my head. So let's say I got this idea. Yeah. So the next thing, can you see this board here? I might bring it here. I, I always there, go, yeah. Yeah. I always pick a celebrity. There's Don French. Yeah, yeah. Um, I pick a celebrity that looks like there's Miriam up there that looks like what I think the character looks like. Right. Yeah. And um, now this is the finished result. This was all over the place. But then I have the weekend break. These are locations. So yeah. it opens in Houston, and then we have Galway, and we've Galway at Christmas time. Sorry. Then they they meet. Um, and then they say at the end here they have coffee. I think that's the, the Radisson Instant Organ. I'm gonna have yeah. to go and double check. So, but before, this is the end result, but I do that up with lots of pictures. And I also go into, um, so like in the one I'm writing now, the character goes to Nice. So I got onto like, um, um, what was I going to say? Um, real estate sites and like my home .ie. Yeah. And <laughs> yeah, and pick the ones I like, go into the, go into the bedroom, the kitchen, the blah, blah, blah. Uh, print them off, put them up, and put them up like a collage, so that I can then see, I can see the character going into those. I can see where they're sitting down on the balcony in Nice and having a drink. I know exactly what it looks like. Um, and for floor plans, it's really good. Just get onto myhome.ie and get onto the floor plan. Now, this was written in lockdown, so I had to you now. I love Galway, and I lived in Galway for six months in the eighties, working as a travel agent. Um, but I'd also been there with my women friends. So I used the same accommodation and the same restaurants and bars that we went into there. And I just had to use that from memory because I couldn't go back down and walk around Galway, right? Yeah. Just, we couldn't even get past that loan. Like when you think of it now, it's bizarre. So generally, so that's what I'll do. I have another one. I have another two boards here for my other two books. Um, These are the ones you're working on at the moment, is it, Ruth? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Very good. Sorry, I can't hear you there. I can't hear you. Sorry, can you hear me. Okay. Can you hear me now? I can hear you now. Sorry. Oh yeah, yeah, sorry. So this is what I'm just saying to you there about Nice. So that's a place called Villefranche, and this is downtown in Nice. And here's the balcony that I saw. 
probably lives there, but I'm after printing it off from a French uh, uh, website just so that I can imagine. So basically, I do that, and then um, I usually know when the, how the book's going to start. So I'll start off with that, start writing it. I generally write it consecutively. Um, sometimes I use the three-act method, which is really four. But I mean, the three-act method is basically what you were taught in school, which was a start, a middle, and an end. Mm -hmm. And the middle is double the size of the start and the end. That's why there's usually act one and act two in it. So by the end of the first, let's say, the first act, which let's say is 10 or 20,000 words, like something has to happen. Mm. So the so I kind of think of that in my head. I might write a few notes uh, of the character. So so let's say for these women, I don't have it beside me. I did nearly like a CV. So I, I typed up, this is before I start writing the story. So what age is Clara? Where does she live? She lives in Rap Mines. How many kids has she got? What's her husband's name? Uh, what height she might be? What size dress she might be? Dress size. Uh, what her job would be, um, what she did after she left school. I, so I did a profile for each of those women. So the clearer it is in my head, yeah. then I know where they're coming from and um, how much uh, income they might have. So like Vivian arrives with her hair perfect in a taxi and poor old Clara is sweating on the Lewis, right? <laughs> on the red line <laughs> yeah. Lewis. It's always packed. Yeah. Um, she can't afford a taxi. So she's gone away on this weekend thinking that she can't afford to go on anymore, that this is going to be her last weekend. Do you know what I mean? Her last mm -hmm. trip away because her financial situation is different. So I nearly, I do a character profile, I guess, before I even start. Wow. Yeah. So um, now, you know, I know what Houston Station looks like. I know what the train to Galway is like. I didn't need to put in all, any, actually, I didn't put in any detail of Houston except that. So I like the idea of your research being like an iceberg, that you have mm. all this research underneath, but the reader only needs to see the top bit of ice sticking out. Cool. But the fact that you have all this research and I know exactly where those restaurants are in. Galway, let's say, it kind of feeds into the story then. It'll flow better if I know all of that, but I don't have to info dump the reader. So I don't have to say you turn left when you go down Main Street, then you turn right. Do you know what I mean? But I yeah. I can have them walking down and what they see while they're walking. Um, so um, I guess I do a little bit of that. Um, and then, so I start writing. And um, try and write in chapters, but I don't have a set uh, word count for each chapter. And then I think nearly everybody gets to, everybody starts with gusto and then you get to about 30,000 words and you go, okay, oh, well, mm, what's going to happen now? Mm -hmm. um, so I try to think ahead and plan out. And um, I always use a very simple method, which is get a big, I, I, I type, this I type the stories in, but I also write scribble stuff on notes and big A4 pads. So when I get stuck or I'm not sure where I'm going next, um, so I'm, I am a kind of plotter in that sense. Um, I know like at what stage I need something to happen, then I need something else to happen, then I know three quarters way through, like just be, you know, I need something massive to happen, and then you have the fallout and the conclusion, um. But if I get stuck, my other tip is I get a big piece of paper and I just write what if on the top. Right. And you can write out 20, and they can be crazy. What if a, What if she's walking down the road and a piano falls in her head? What if the house goes on fire? Uh, what if, um, you know, the bin man throws out the wrong bin and all her paperwork's in it? Like that might, and maybe none of us, but it, it helps unblock the things in your head if you're stuck. Yeah, well, that's great. Because I was going to ask you about that, like, you know, writer's block. So that's a great method to get out of that, yeah? Yeah. yeah. The other thing I do is, and it's usually around the middle, uh, is if I know how it's going to end, I write that. Now, I didn't know how this was going to end um, 
well, the, the one I'm writing at, right, that the one I've just finished now, book three, I didn't know how it was going to end, but I knew what the prologue would, or the epilogue would be, the, the end of it. I knew what would happen like three months later at the end. So I wrote that. And then in the second book, I knew exactly how it was going to end and where they'd be sitting and what they'd be eating. So I wrote that, but I didn't know how they were going to get there. Right. So I, yeah. I saw it in my head. I knew who was going to be at the end. I got to a third of the way up. So at least I knew, OK, well, now I just need to get these characters to the end. But something massive has to happen. But it's a kind of a relief then. It's nearly like a, a road sign, you know. Yeah, because that's that's a great because a lot of people, um, myself included, might have a, a problem with, with finishing a book or finishing a story because it's like, I don't know if you ever worked out prompts. But mm. like um, people in my workers group, they work off prompts every week and and like you've got the story keep going on and there's no real end. So that, that that's a good idea to have an actual end in mind. Yeah. Just imagine yeah. what it would go out for a walk, go out yeah. for a walk. Imagine what it would be like to end this story. Even think of two endings and even just scribble them down in your A4 notebook. Write the two endings and then you go, OK, and it nearly takes the pressure off. Yeah, you know, and you can always change it, you know, mm. but you have um, it stops you being blocked for starters. Yeah. And um, and that what if once you write down, you might go, well, they're crazy Four of those are crazy, but maybe this might work. And then, you know, if the bin men threw out the wrong paper bin and all the stuff, well, then what would that what would the knock on effect of that be, you know, mm -hmm. or if yeah. the house went on fire, how many people could you get out? So. It can lead you down other ways. The other thing to absolutely not do if you're stuck is to go back and start editing what you've already written. Now, yeah, I, that, I that's the other thing. My top tip, write till the end. Yeah. There are so many unfinished manuscripts on people's laptops. Yeah. And uh, you can't edit a blank page. You can't go back. You can go back and fix it 100 million times. But the absolute joy of getting to the end, even... Like I, some writer, I don't know who, calls it like a, a vomit draft, that you just get that whole story out. And it it might you might think this is rubbish, but it's better to have something that's rubbish with the end on it. And then you put it in a drawer for about four weeks or move on and write something else and then come back and look at it with new eyes. And then you go, oh, actually, that mightn't be as bad as I thought. Or else, yeah, that whole middle bit is rubbish. I have to take it out. But you're still working on something that's finished yeah. rather than if you went back, if you wrote 10 chapters, got stuck and went back and start perfecting them, you'd listen, you'd be here five years later. Nobody is ever going to be 100% happy with what they write. Exactly. I, yeah. th I think if somebody thinks that they've written a masterpiece, they I, I'm nearly 99.9% .9 sure they absolutely haven't. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <yeah. laughs> so so there's three books um, all together in the, in the, in the series, yeah? Yeah, so yeah. here's another here's another tip I picked up. Um, when I was watching author interviews all through COVID, um, and they're on the writing.ie website for anybody to look at, right? And they're really it's, well. First of all, you understand then that everybody works differently, so you're not writing a right way or a wrong way. Everybody does it differently. But the one thing I kept hearing over and over again from debut authors was the pressure of the second book. And it's like musicians with the second album, right? Mm -hmm. um, and that like you have so much time to write the first and then you're given a time limit to write the second. And I thought, well, I don't want that pressure. So I decided that I was going to have at least two books written and finished before I'd even approach an agent or a publisher or think of publishing number one. And I'm so glad I did that because there's like leading up to... Um, imagine like I can't imagine trying to come up with ideas and write a second book now when I'm in like I handed this book to Pool Bag last March and it's only been published now it takes a year right and you're doing promotion and you're trying to you know put it up on Instagram and I'm getting ready for a book launch and your head would be adult you know the last thing yeah. you'd want to do is write so instead when I when uh when I signed with Pool Bag I gave them I gave him the first book in March and I gave him the second book in June because it was done. And um, and the third, I had a third book, 
but I wasn't completely happy with it. So I parked that one because I wrote it for like a penguin romance competition. And but whereas mine is more contemporary uh, fiction. Uh, so I've since written number three and uh, that's the first draft, I think kind of first, second draft. So, um, but that takes the whole pressure off then, you know, when you have that other book. Um, so yeah, that was a really good tip that I learned from listening to other authors. Don't, you know, no publisher, uh, and this goes for self-publishing as well. If no publisher is going to give you a one book deal, they don't want, they don't do it. They're, they're just, they don't exist. It'll be a two book or a three book deal. But also if you're self-publishing and you put a book up on Amazon, people will have forgotten you in six months time. The best way to do really well at self-publishing is to have another book coming very closely by. And then you can refer back to your other one. People who've read this book would like this one. And you can gain momentum that way. That's why series, series like books in the one series work and um, do really well in self-publishing because if people like one, then they eat up the others. But if they have to wait for eight months or a year for your other ones, they're going to move on to somebody else. Um, so yeah, that's another tip about that. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's that's a great tip. Yeah, thanks a lot for that. Because like it makes so much sense because like I, I'm not known about the publishing world. I, I, I've, all, I've heard like they're going to put you under pressure to have another story out. So it's taken away that pressure. That, so that's a great idea. Yeah. 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 Well done on that. That's that's great. Now, thanks a lot for sharing your your your, your work. Like, and um, what I might do is now is ask a few of your favorites, if that's okay. Um, your your, your fa own favorite kind of it doesn't, doesn't have to be their favorite, but a favorite that comes to mind, an author or a book you you, you like to to read. What type of books? Yeah, and I actually, I don't have a favourite author. I think you have, I, I favourite authors at different times. So like okay, in yeah. the 80s, it would have been like all Maeve Binchy books and then Joanna Trollope and then Marion Keyes came out. But the, the thread going through them are books about ordinary people that you'd pass at the bus stop or whatever who look like they have ordinary, you know, you just mm. wouldn't notice them. And yet they have major things going on behind or... You know, it's so it's really or, or else something happens to them. So it's an ordinary person who has to deal with a, an extraordinary situation and how they cope with that. Um, and I love books set in Ireland. But I also um, I didn't tell you this, but I write a travel blog. It's called Rambling Ruth and it's on my website, RuthO'LearyWriter.com. Um, and I write that once a month and um, because I love travel. Um, so. I love Bill Bry so in nonfiction, I love Bill Bryson's travel books. They're absolutely hilarious. Um, and I know they're kind of old now, but I really like them. And um I also like some translated books, um, like Japanese books that have been translated into English, like um the phone box at the edge of the world is absolutely brilliant. That it was written after the tsunami. Um, and people go to this phone box to talk to the people that have died. They're, they aren't there on the end of the phone obviously but it's actually based on a true story that a Japanese man put has a he had a beautiful plot of land overlooking the sea and he actually put a phone box there for people to go and grieve so it's an amazing story yeah, so yeah. that was yeah and um, the phone box at the edge of the world it's an amazing story based on a true story um and another Japanese one I read was um when the coffee goes cold which is really good um, but other non-fiction books, I know you're into motivation and all that sort of thing. Um, yeah, and I, yeah. ha I have I have been to Japan. That's We were into Japan in oh, 2019 brilliant. and we absolutely loved it. So Beth Kempton writes a book called Wabi Sabi, which is um, Japanese wisdom for perfectly imperfect lives. But for writers, I haven't I've only started this, uh, The Way of the Fearless Writer. And. It's it's nonfiction. She's a writing teacher anyway, Beth Kempton. Uh, but and she's a Japanologist, I think. She lived in Japan for years. But it's about writing without fear, getting it. Don't be worrying. Don't be thinking about who's going to read your book when you're writing it. Mm. Write fearlessly, basically, uh, and see what comes out. And don't restrict yourself. Don't be thinking, oh, my mother's going to read this, or what will people think if I have really dark thoughts and I put them down on paper. Um, so that's a really 
that's good. I'm, I'm going to get stuck into that now. Um, and the other tip I'd have for no matter what genre you're right is um, I go to a festival every year called the Murder One Festival. It's on in Dunleary. Okay. Well, I say yeah. I I say every year the past two years, but it's crime, and I you li I'm listening to amazing crime writers like Liz Nugent and um what's his name Harlan, oh my God, uh, Harlan Coben. When you listen to a, a crime writer, because every book you write, uh, and even children's books, they need a twist or they need a reveal. Yeah. something amazing is going to happen or something you didn't see was going to happen, you know, especially in kids' books, actually. Mm -hmm. um, so crime writers are thinking that way the whole time. Crime writers have to weave through red herrings for their writers. So even though I don't write crime, I suggest that anybody who writes any genre go along to listen to crime authors, how they think, how they plan, because you pick up some really good tips and everybody needs, like I said, a twist or a reveal in their book, no matter what you're writing. Mm. So I, I had never read crime at all until I start going to that festival in Dunleary. And um, so that's another good tip. Yeah. So I that's so they're the kind of books that I would that I read. Yeah. Very good. No, that that sounds really good because yeah, you, you got hooked from that festival. <laughs> you, yeah, yeah, yeah. Very good. Yeah, and it's only <laughs> on the stuff. it's on the dark line, so that's yeah. very handy. Brilliant. Yeah, and your favorite kind of music to listen to as well. Well, that's um, that's really eclectic as well. Like I grew yeah. up in the eighties, so I remember seeing ACDC and the RDS. I actually wrote a short story about it because oh, my friend Pat, my well, my friend passed out, and we had to. Yeah, anyway, because. <laughs> There was no health and safety in those days. And you, no. I actually remember going into school and being deaf for like two days. Yeah. Because, you know, so like you were trying to get to the front and you're right beside those big speakers. Um, But actually, I love going to music festivals. And myself and my husband and the kids did, believe it or not, 10 years of electric picnic uh, in the family camping. And, uh, and the last two years, we did uh, Forever Young. Uh, which was just absolutely hilarious. But the thing I like about um, like uh, Electric Picnic and festivals is like that, is that you go down, think with your list of who you want to see. And like we saw like Robert Plant, we saw Chrissy Hind, we saw like legends down there. And then you walk past a tent. And I remember, you know, to get to somewhere else. And we went in and we saw this crazy King Kong company from Waterford, dance, crazy dance hip hop. I don't even know what they were. And it was one of the best gigs. We'd never even heard of them. And then you, I, we walked into another one and it was a group called War on Drugs. And I was just blown away. I love festivals for that whole mm -hmm. eclectic thing. Yeah. And then you might be queuing up for your chips beside Hosier. So, um, <laughs> so I hope that... Uh, you know, to continue the eighties festival though for every young is absolutely hilarious and really good. I highly recommend it. So um that's more yes. bucket list. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and do you ever listen to music when you write Ruth? Do you ever no, oh. I don't. And I and I don't know, I think it would distract me. I'd probably start yeah. singing and then I'd get distracted. Mm. Um but I also don't write in complete silence either, insofar as I don't have to have everybody out of the house and I, or because I think you you ruin yourself then because then you'd be like, well, I can only write in the quiet. It's like it goes back to um I don't know if you have kids, but I remember being told when we had our first kid, like, don't uh keep a quiet house for them to fall asleep. You know, don't tiptoe yeah. around them because they will wake at every single sound then. So let the dog bark and let the door go. And it's the same thing. Then your kids will sleep through anything. So you know, that means I can sit here and, you know, they can be opening and closing the fridge 50 times because I have three boys um, and it won't distract me, you know. So, um, but no, I couldn't, I couldn't write to music. I think I'd yeah. be thinking about it. I know, well, no, that's quite well, no, just that's something that I started doing recently. News yeah, do no, you find it helps? Yeah, with no words, like, you know. Um, oh, yeah, but, maybe. That, that's like, you find it kind of getting the flow. When you're listening to kind of music without words, I wouldn't recommend with words. But yeah, <laughs> like you said, but yeah, yeah. But um, everybody to their own. Like everybody has their own. Absolutely, I <laughs> yeah. think uh, Own Colfer listens to heavy metal really loud, 
wow. on headphones in a shed. But he said because it, it you can't think when you're listening. So he he reckons then he the stuff that comes out is completely from the back of his head. Wow. But um, I don't know. I don't think I could do that either. No. <laughs> that one, no. Yeah. So the next question will be pretty interesting because you're into films, you're you're you you do the films. And have you ever thought of trying to get your new book or one of your books into a kind of a film, or is is that something well, that you're, you're thinking of? I'd absolutely love it. And actually, that's the advantage of having um either yeah. a publisher or an agent. So my agent uh is uh, Kate Nash in the UK. And she was actually over here in November. I didn't see her. I've only met her once in the whole time I know her. And um, she was pushing, pitching my book and uh, three other people that she represents to the Irish screenwriters here. I didn't even know about it. Uh, insofar as she, she sent me an email to say she was coming over to do it. I didn't have to go. I didn't have to do anything. They didn't pick my book this time, but she will have it in her catalogue at the London Book Fair where... The public can't go. It's all um, TV companies and other book and translation people. So it is handy having an agent because um, she'll just go and do that and she'll keep your books in her catalogue. And, you know, you never know. Uh, if it if that happened, that would be an absolute dream, and I would absolutely have to be an extra in it somewhere. Definitely, <laughs> <laughs> you'd have to play one of the characters. Of, oh, I'm I sure. don't think so. No. I don't think I, no, I won't do that. <laughs> no. I know what happens though. <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> on second thoughts, yeah. <laughs> Very good. Yeah, and your favorite kind of film, or doesn't be um, really our film, my, you know, just yeah. Uh, my favorite. Like if I, my favorite movie is probably Shirley Valentine. And uh, I was only thinking about this today. And I think it's the arc of the character. Again, an ordinary woman who's gone home with her shop and nobody knows, she gets splashed by the bus. Um, People that you just don't notice in life going about their daily business and um, her life changes and she has all these thoughts in her head or whatever. Um, So, it, and then she's a different person at the end. So I guess that's the, you know that that's kind of what has to go into nearly every book no matter what the character is you know even if they're in game of thrones or they're wherever they have to have gone on a journey as they say um i do like movies uh foreign movies as well um there's a brilliant again japanese one called uh shoplifters that was up for an oscar about two years ago and it's just absolutely stunning and um from an Irish point of view, I really loved on um, Colleen Kuhn. I don't know if you mm. saw that. Yeah, Claire what Keegan a film. One. It was great. Yeah, it was really great. Yeah. yeah. And actually, I'm an extra in... So, Claire Keegan, I'm not an extra in that one, but uh, the one that's out now, uh, Small Things Like These with Killian Murphy, um, it's actually opened the Berlin Film Festival, I think, this week. Um, so I'm an extra in that. I'm just, um, so I was there on the same day that Killian Murphy was there and, um, it's just in a church scene. Yeah. Uh, I probably won't even recognize myself in it by the time it comes out. Um, but it's great. I read, I read her book, small things like these, and it was absolutely brilliant. And then to actually be an extra in it, mm. uh, is great. So it really interlinks, yeah. you know, the two things I do. Definitely, yeah, brilliant, yeah. Um, which one would would your favorite one you've been in as an actual what film would you say was your your favorite to, to work on? <laughs> um, let me think. That's a hard question. I'd say Kin was interesting, was it? I'd say interesting. Oh was, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it was. And even though I love the period dramas, we did a thing called Ripper Street. I don't. Very few people saw it. I think it was on in the BBC. Uh, and actually, Matthew McFadden was in it. Um, from Succession. But, uh, and we were all in period costume. So that was great because it went on for months and months and months. But Ken, oh my God, like the atmosphere on Ken. And I was in the pub on the last scene of the last series. Don't want to spoil it for anybody who hasn't seen it yet. But that way, and even though you know it's not real, your, abs your heart absolutely stops when someone comes in with a gun to the pub. And they, yeah. and the guards were outside, you know, because it's, it might, it, I don't know, imitation firearms and all that sort of thing. Um, it's a very big deal. Um, and yeah, your heart's be in your mouth, even though you know it's not real. Um, 
And recently, um, I was in a the secret scriptures with Vanessa Redgrave. That was amazing. So it's amazing when you see people that you go, oh wow, like acting mm. royalty. Um, and of course, Russell Crowe was in uh, the Pope's Exorcist. Um, but there's been some bizarre ones. I was recently a chaperone on. Um, it's going to be called the Astronaut. I think. I think it's going. It's an American production. But we were up in the Dublin Mountains at night, and the special effects people, there's an alien ship basically lands in the forest. <laughs> so we're standing there and they have the lights attached, spoiler, and all the lights attached to a building and, and a, a you know, a, a scaffold basically. And mm -hmm. the lights are running and it's, uh, but the light got filtering through all the forest was absolutely stunning. And then they have the fake smoke as well. Um, and I'm minding the little girl um, who has to, who's running up to the spaceship. Um, so, like, that's just a mad thing to be doing on a Thursday night instead of going to Aldi. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Look around, there's an audience. So I, yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, that's great. Yeah. Jesus. Well, there could be a spaceship in the middle aisle. You never know. Exactly, yeah. No, that, that's great. Thanks a lot for, for sharing that. Like, um, a very interesting work. <laughs> very good. Yeah. Yeah. So that's great route. And um, your favorite places to travel as well. I know you, you love Japan. Like I said, Japan was a great Yeah, great, great absolutely trip. love that. Yeah. Um Venice is uh, I absolutely love Venice. I've been I have been there loads of times. Again, I like to travel. I like to go to like when you get to Venice, you're it's like being on a movie set. And when you go to Japan, you're completely transported. Uh we went to Morocco last year. As soon as you're in the Medina, it's like going back in time. Um, and this year we're going to Vietnam. So, um, yeah, I like to, and I think, you know, in 20 years time, you know, maybe I won't be fit enough or, you know, you're never, you're as, today is as young and healthy as you are. Do you know what I mean? You don't know yeah. what, what's the future is going to hold. So I think while you're still able to run around and carry your own bag, you should do the the long haul travel and do the exciting places, you know. Definitely, yeah. um, while you still can, yeah. You've no, so, pro you, you've no problems with flying, so Ruth. <laughs> uh, no, I'm not mad about it, but uh, it's worth it when you get there. And of course, I love doing all the research, you know. Yeah. So, um, I love doing all that beforehand. Um, you know, even down to the best places to get a coffee in Saigon. Like I'm actually looking at that detail. Um, and that's why I like the brilliant system you have. Yeah, it's a brilliant system you have. Yeah. And, Definitely share all your information. You've shared everything with me, so I'm going to put it all on the show notes for, yeah. for you guys to check out. Um, Thank you. Yeah, definitely, yeah. And can I just ask you, because it's a motivational podcast as well. Yeah. Kind of, what, what kind of keeps you motivated in your writing as well? Well, I love talking about motivation. So, um, and I say this to my kids, if you're going to hang around and wait for motivation, you'll never do anything, right? Um, the motivation for whether it's uh, like if you want to do exercise and you know and you really don't want to go out because it looks horrible you've got to think well hang on I want to get fit because I want to go hiking in the summer I want to run around with my grandchildren I want to be able to do that right so with writing I actually visualized being at my own book launch before I even had a book deal so when I finished writing that I, like I said to you, I decided, okay, well, this, I'm going to get this book out in the world. I'll try tradition. If that doesn't work, well, then I'll do self publishing. So the whole time I kept this idea of holding, even holding your own book, right? Holding your own book and visualize it. And it, but you have to add the feelings along with that. So it's the feeling of, oh my God, I'm holding my own book. Oh my God, it's actually printed. Uh, uh, who will I send it to? Who will re who'll read it? How will I feel when I hand it? Those feelings, or even imagine the people looking back at you at the book launch, uh, imagine signing your book for somebody. Those feelings get you excited and motivated. But it's, it's those feelings in the visualization, those chemicals are what you need now to sit down and write. Mm -hmm. so by visualizing the end result whether that's been a really fit granddad and been able to put your kids on your shoulders at a soccer or a gam match right 
that will make you go out for a walk today and tomorrow and to not be lazy about it, right? To say, okay, it's Ireland, it's going to rain. Um, I heard a really good thing recently. You're not a disparate, do you know what I mean? You're not going to dissolve if you go out in the rain in this country. Um, it's the, think about how you want to be, think about the feeling like, oh my God, like the amount of times I visualized holding a book that I didn't even know the cover of, but holding my book, showing it to people, how amazing would that be? And and of course you're going to think, oh, well, that only happens to other people. Yeah, well, what if it doesn't, you know? Uh, it's never going to happen to you if you never write. It, okay, <laughs> That's a definite. <laughs> okay. Yeah. It's never going to happen if you don't do it. So there's a chance. To, and like I said, self-publishing is there's absolutely no reason, no matter what you write, that you can't through self-publishing today, hold a copy of your book or, you know, see it on an Amazon site. So it's keep visualizing the end result and that will give you the motivation to sit down and do it. Well, that's a brilliant tip. Absolutely brilliant. Thanks very much. And then it's so important as well to be dissociated when you're visualizing as well, because if you're associated, you think you've already, you've already received it, you've already got there. So <laughs> just, mm. just, you know, so that's a good, good, good little tip as well to add to that. Yeah. 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 No, I really appreciate you coming on, Ruth. Um, it's been a pleasure talking to the podcast and I wish you all the success with everything you do as well with all your writing and your film work. And I hope Thank to see, you so much. I hope to see that in the movie um, fairly shortly. <laughs> yeah, and yeah. it's actually Mother's Day. is come, So this is out yeah. on the 4th of March. Mother's Day is the 10th of March. So this is an ideal Mother's Day present. And I think Bookstation... Um, are doing a Mother's Day promotion on it, but you can pick it up in Easton's or order it online. You can pre-order it now and have your Mother's Day present sorted. So uh, that's my uh, plug there for myself. Right. Yeah, so I'm looking forward to sharing all your information on the show notes for people to check out as well. Great. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. That's yeah. brilliant. Thanks so much, Mark. Really enjoyed it. Right. Yeah. So thanks everyone for checking out this podcast. Ruth O'Leary, um, her, her book's out pretty shortly. Now she... Uh, you get a copy of it for Mother's Day. And um, so uh, thanks again, again, Ruth. And thanks everyone for watching. Until next time, take care and sign up all. Good night. Hello, everyone. Mark here. Thank you for watching another episode of my Authors Tuesday podcast. I recently published a book of children's stories called The Adventures of Larry Lampos and Friends. The book began life as bedtime stories I wrote for my own children. If you'd like to purchase my book, follow the link in the description box below. By buying my book, you are also supporting my podcast series for authors, which is giving a voice to writers in Ireland and across the world.